What's going on, everybody? Ryan Miner here of the Face Off Sports Network, and Week 7 was a blast of fantasy football. Kicking off Thursday night, Denver Broncos, New Orleans Saints, Javante Williams. Many people told you to sit him. Did you? Because he put up two touchdowns, over 25 fantasy points. He was a dominant force. And then Sunday, you know, we had our first game in London between the J Jacksonville Jaguars, which are they still going to be the Jacksonville Jaguars? Feels like they should be moving over there with, with the way they play all their games over there. But I about that. So Jacksonville versus the New England Patriots. Finally, Jacksonville gets another victory on the season. And then my Detroit Lions, as I always like to say, taking on the undefeated at the time, Minnesota Vikings, to go in and dominate 31-29. And what was started out to be a dominant one-way game between, on the Vikings, then the Lions came back, and then Minnesota came back, and then the Lions win with a game-winning field goal. But then we also had the game of the week, which was a total snoozer of the Kansas City Chiefs taking on the San Francisco 49ers. It was another, you know, not magical type of game from Patrick Mahomes. You know, we've seen better Patrick Mahomes. What's going on with him? But we're not be talking about him, but we will be talking about other players throughout these games as we had some high scores and some low ones that kind of throw up a, oh boy, what should we do now, folks? So without further ado. We're going to get into that. Follow me on X at Ryan Miner underscore FFB. Follow the show at FF Faceoff. And don't, and don't forget to go to FFFaceoff.com for all your fantasy football needs. Furthermore, ask any questions on any players that you have. Like, I'm going to do five. If they're not five, hit them up in the comments below, people. And also, don't forget to like and subscribe. And all your questions will be answered. You know, just let me have them. And so. Let's kick it off. I'm going to kick it off with Sunday's game, Sunday morning's game. And one player I'm definitely panicking is starting to look into is Ramondre Stevenson. Now, although he missed last week's game and didn't practice in full until he landed Friday in London, Stevenson game gave us a limited production, rushing the ball seven times for 18 yards. Yet the Jaguars allowed up to this game the second most receiving yards to running backs. And Stevenson. I thought was going to capitalize as many others did too, because that's what Stevenson was always known for was being a pass catching back. But that didn't seem to happen this week as he just turned in two receptions on three targets for seven yards, a total snoozer. He couldn't get us five fantasy P PPR points folks. So I'm kind of starting to look at him, you know, like he was a solid RB two, but did not surprisingly perform that way. Was what was surprising was Stevenson was scripted out for the likes of Jermichael Hasty, who caught all five of his targets for 49 yards, including a receiving touchdown. Not panicking a little bit, like I said a little bit ago, but I'm I bumped up another tier again just because the foot injury is a little iffy. I'm thinking maybe he was still recovering from that. The late practice report, you know, coming in Friday, he wasn't really probably game ready, you know, the jet lag and everything coming in. I'm going to put him at a uh, about a four and be cautious. You know, if he can make it up next week, I could definitely, you know, he'll be dropping down, not be someone I'm really too worried about. But, you know, this is the, uh, the first time again in three of his last four games that he's been under 50 rushing yards. And second, the target share for Stevenson isn't there, like I said earlier, like it was last season. Now, I'm hoping for a bounce back, like I already said. As he gets the New York Jets, who just gave up over 100 rushing yards to Najee Harris. Now we know how the Jets, you know, thought we'd get Devontae Adams would be a boom, but now that team's starting to look like a bust. Moving on. Oh, with Anthony Richardson back under center, the passing offense in Indianapolis Colts took a step back. I wouldn't even say it was really a step back, I was almost thinking like a dive back because. Richardson's inefficiency of completing only 10 of 24 passes for 129 yards doesn't boost well, not only for Michael Pittman, but the rest of this receiving core. Like it did, like it did, like when it had Joe Flacco under center. He was able to, you know, give Michael Pittman the ball. He was a dominant force. He made Michael Pittman look like a high wide receiver, too, which was great for our fantasy football teams. I loved it. But then, you know, with Anthony Richardson coming back, which I was actually quite surprised they came back because I was thinking, you know, the Indianapolis Colts would want to win. 
but it didn't seem to happen that way as Richardson was healthy enough. But I understand, you know, the draft capital they put into him. They're going to want to get him on the field, give him exposure. It just didn't seem to pan out. But one thing that was nice about Richardson and Pittman's chemistry yesterday is a deep ball starting to kind of look like something between the two of them as Pittman caught a 31-yard and a 21-yard pass. However, the volume may not be there for Pittman or any of this other receiving core going forward. And it's kind of hard because as I look at him now, like you had him as a wide receiver too with Flacco as he was putting up 10, 15 plus fantasy points. I'm panicking on this right now, folks. I have him at a seven. I have a hard time thinking, thinking about even putting him in my uh, lineup right now. Yeah, the deep balls were good, but you know, if, if we're lining on those deep balls week in and week out, I just don't see it. Plus, let's not forget, Jonathan Taylor is out of the lineup and he's going to be back. And he could be back as soon as this week. You know, with the likes of Tyler Goodson and Trey Sermon yesterday or Sunday, depending on when you guys uh, watch this, it just doesn't look good. So I can see this being more of a Jonathan Taylor, Anthony Richardson game with a dink and dunk type of Michael Pittman where you get a sprinkle of six, seven, maybe eight PPR points. But, you know, he can lead the team in targets like he did yesterday again along the, the receptions and yardage. But overall, the game change from Flacco to Richardson is definitely a, a step back. And, and as of right now, I just can't trust him in my lineups. My third player this week, and it just came out the news that he did officially tear his ACL per sleeper. And that's Brandon Ayuk. Now, he's a returning player on this, and I don't like putting injured players on here, but when I put this all my notes together, we were assuming it was going to be an injury that you know was going to have him out for the foreseeable future. We weren't, didn't know exact diagnostics. It was fear tore ACL. It has now been confirmed as a tore ACL. He is out for the season. I am at a full 10 out of 10 panic on this because many of us draft him as a back-end wide receiver one, high-end wide receiver two. He just hasn't panned out as he had one game that was over 100 uh, receiving yards that was actually good for over 20 fancy points, you know, PPR points. And then after that, you know, it was always less than 50 yards over the rest of its games. And still, they didn't have a touchdown on the season. Now that, if you guys were able to watch a game uh, Sunday afternoon of the Kansas City Chiefs and the San Francisco 49ers, and you saw that catch, you would have seen the way uh, Ayuk's knee buckled. And not only with Ayuk was out, so was Debo Samuel. So that whole offense just kind of sputtered because it was just George Kittle and then a whole bunch of uh, receivers. You know, you got Jacob Cowing, who actually was the only one that actually really did something. Ricky Pearsall finally made his debut, didn't really produce much. And then we still didn't have Juwan Jennings also. So this wide receiver core is quite missing it's a lot and trying to rely so much on George Kittle. So. It was a very tough one to fall back on. So, Brandon Ayuk, I hope you recover well, come back, you know, because we, we like we like having your fantasy, bud. But for those of you who have Debo Samuel and George Kittle, he is on the up and up. If I'm a Brandon Ayuk owner, I'm trying to figure out what to do, you know, see the hit the waiver wire. Be sure, you know, like I said, FFFaceoff.com because we will have that up here soon. And also... You know, see if you can try to trade away, try to get, you know, Debo Samuel or a receiver from the uh, San Francisco 49ers. You know, maybe Juwan Jennings is out there under waiver wire. He'd be one I'd be definitely going after due to, after this injury now. And my th fourth player this week is Tyreek Hill. QB proof? No, not at all. When two of us out, I'm going to say it straight. This offense sucks. If they can't move the ball, they don't know how to adjust. And then you look at what happened yesterday. You look at Tyreek's fantasy score. You're like, what? Two points. He had two targets, people. Two targets. You don't do that to the number one wide receiver. We were drafting him so high in our fantasy football drafts, you know, top three, top five. We were spending so much money in our auctions to get him. He was a lock and loaded Game changer wide receiver for our fantasy football teams. And then you look at it, 
you know, Tyler Huntley was not the answer. But anyway, and uh, with the news coming out right now, here and today, is that Tua Tago Viola cleared the concussion protocol and is set to practice this week, so Wednesday, and should be able to suit back up week eight, which is going to be great because this offense needed, and that includes Jalen Waddle, as he's also been feeling the pain just like Tyreek Hill has. And this is where I'm hopefully we get a nice bounce back because the Dolphins get the my the Dolphins get the Miami Dolphins? No. No, they don't get themselves. The Dolphins get the Arizona Cardinals, who have been ugh, detrimental against wide receivers. And if Tua is able to come back out, jump right back in it, get this team back up where it needs to be. I'm not panicking on Tua. I'm actually looking to get Tua if I can in any of my fantasy football leagues. And you guys should look to get him too. Finally, my homer team, guys. Yes, I will actually say one of my own homer team. Who, who are you going to guess it's going to be? I would say yes, Jamison Williams, but it's not Jamison Williams. It's another one who actually went as finished as tight end one last season. And that is Sam Laporta. My, how I have the fantasy football tight ends fallen this season. What is going on? Outside of George Kittle, really? Like I said, you know, prior episodes, the tight end position has just sucked. You know, Trey McBride starting to come in. We'll see how he does here on Monday night. But the rest of the tight ends, just it's almost just like, you know, there's 15 tight ends. Put them in your lineup. Hope for the best. You know, one of them being David Njoku, many people thought, you know, wasn't someone to put, throw in their lineup. He had a hell of a performing week. But we're not here to talk about David Njoku. We're here to talk about Sam Laporta. Now, last season alone, Laporta saw at least five targets in 15 to 17 games. Through six games, he has one. That's it. One game of five or more targets. And if or more, doesn't even say it was five targets in week one. Last week, he was saved by a 52 yard touchdown reception because that's all he had. He had one reception against the Dallas Cowboys and gave him a touchdown. He was able to finish with double digit PPR points just on that catch. Then here against a division rival in the Minnesota Vikings, you think Laporta would see more targets as this defense tends to be more porous and easy to throw on. You know, you can't really run on them, but that's what not what happened. Jameer Gibbs ran on him for two touchdowns. And then what happens? Sam Laporta sees one target again. One target. You know, how does that happen? Heck, Tim Patrick and Khalif Raymond saw more targets than Sam Laporta. Khalif Raymond. Gets the touchdown. You know, come on. But also, this is the fourth game in a row where Jared Goff threw at the least 25 passes. Like, he has not thrown for any more. And he hasn't thrown 25 more attempts in over the last four games. But when this offense is clicking with a dynamic duo of Amon Ross St. Brown and Sonic and Knuckles, as we like to, as the terms going with uh, Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery, this offense is going. But yesterday, it was the Gibbs and Amon Ross St. Brown show. And Laporta has fallen down the pecking order. And it's got me freaking out, guys. I'm down here at an 8. And like I said, you know, with other players out there, I'm benching Laporta going forward. I don't want to start him. Yeah, he's a great name. If you can get anything for him, I'd be willing to trade him for right now for that just until we see it. Or if you really just want to sit him and don't want to trade him because you think of the upcoming schedule could help, Go ahead and do that. But, you know, start playing the waiver wire. Start playing the strength of the schedule. You know, that right now, Sam Laporta is more of a tight end two in fantasy football, which is hard to believe. But I'm sorry. He's almost basically pushing the waiver wire. Well, that's going to do it for this week's panic meter. Once again, if you have any questions about any players that I might have missed, hit them down in the comments below. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. I'm Ryan Miner for the Face Off Sports Network. We'll see you guys next week.